go. All right, now I begin a new stream dedicated to studying the concept of leisure. If you haven't watched the previous one, you may check check it out. Since uh, today I'm gonna go deeper and read some books, some articles, and comment on them. So now let's uh, sum up everything what was done yesterday. Yesterday I I read the definition of leisure here on Wikipedia, and uh, most of the time I spent figuring out what's written here in these three paragraphs. And today I'm gonna go deeper. And uh, so I'm gonna read probably history. Yeah, I'm gonna read yeah, the history of leisure. And then uh, after that, I'm gonna share with you another, another tool, which I use to prepare for conversations which is uh, finding some quotes. So and I'm going to show you how I find quotes for the discussion about leisure. But first, let's, uh, let's uh, read the article on Wikipedia. Leisure has historically been the privilege of the upper class. And by the way, I read yesterday, I didn't read, I watched a video where some professor was uh, talking about uh, Thurstein Veblen's uh, theory of uh, leisure class. And it was 20 minutes long, 20 minute long video where basically uh, were presented ideas like conspicuous leisure, some other leisure. I don't remember all of them. I don't want to retell all, all this. It's not my purpose here. I just want to say that I watched the video and I just got a little bit more, you know. <laughs> okay, it's so, so it's harder today to start the video. Yesterday it was kind of experiment. And uh, when I started recording, I wasn't actually doing it for you know for somebody else even though i recorded the video published on youtube i still was uh, you know kind of more relaxed and now i feel that there's some kind of pressure so it's not my leisure time anymore yesterday i was making a video and it was my leisure time but today it feels kind of different and i know exactly because I know exactly why it is since uh, now I'm kind of I'm trying to perform so instead of just being you know instead of just studying the concept and trying to figure out uh, its meaning I'm trying to you know present myself as a kind of you know a different character anyway let's go on it's uh, I'm not here to complain I'm just uh, stating the fact that my mood changed after I published the video and now I think a little bit different. Maybe I won't publish these videos. Yeah, I guess I have to record these videos without uh, thinking about the audience. Yeah, this is the key element here. So to think aloud and to be open, to not pretend that I'm somebody else who just performs for, for the audience, I have to do it like to keep in mind that i'm doing it only for myself not for somebody else this is the key point and i want to linger a little bit more and say like tell your story <laughs> even though like i'm telling the story to myself anyway i want to just recollect the story so the story is just a part of my experience i remember when i was writing my journals like I started writing journals since 2008 and since 2011, I started doing it uh, regularly on daily basis. And since 2000, like during the year of 2012, I developed a really good style. So I learned to write brilliantly. And at the end of 2012, well, it was brilliant for myself, obviously. 
later in 2014 for example when i was rereading my journals i i thought that it's just useless crap not all of them but most of them but at that moment at the end of 2012 i thought that my journals my style my language became brilliant and i decided to publish these journals so i decided that i'm going i'm going to go online and but by that time i was publishing my like works on prosa Roo. and uh, there i decided to publish my journals and instead of writing them in a notebook i started writing my journals like on the computer and immediately pu pu publish them on the internet and in a few in a in a few weeks i discovered that my style changed and instead of being real and talking about what was actually going on in my life basically describing my experience i started pretending that i was somebody else so my language changed so hugely that uh, i decided to quit publishing my journals since i realized that i don't want to you know <laughs> injure my writing and my style uh, by you know this stupid thing since for me it was stupid i wanted to describe what was going on i wanted to study myself but instead of that i was just doing some stupid work i, I was just pretending that i'm better than i was i was using some special words and expressions which i haven't used uh, before i just tried to write you know i didn't try to write what was real i tried to write uh, in a way that it uh, made me look better than i was and it was stupid and i know that it's like it's not the way so if you if uh, once want to if one wants to get uh, further in personal development it's like you have to see what's real you shouldn't picture yourself as a kind of perfect uh, philosopher or writer or anybody you have to understand who you are at this particular moment and the growth uh, the real growth comes after you understand it and then you see what's going on you describe it you don't pretend that you're somebody else and then it just gets better and better but you know whenever you have to do it for public like i'm doing it right now it's like there are different emotions and i wouldn't say it's harder but uh, i certainly don't tell like i don't i'm not saying the same what i would say if i were sitting here alone and there idea the goal here is to do <laughs> not doing which is like i know it makes no sense so if you want to understand it better just read uh, castaneda's uh, journey to Iceland. so the whole idea is that i i'm aware that i am recording this video and i'll publish it but i have to pretend that i don't record it in order to have access to my deep thoughts and ideas to my you know real self so as soon as i'm doing it for somebody else it's not it's not true and uh when i pretend that i'm doing it like for myself even though i'm aware that i'm doing it like for for the imaginary audience it gets better and i and i don't feel any social pressure and i might do something real so the purpose here is to be real to re not just studying of course studying is just one thing but basically the whole idea is to be authentic in front of the camera and not pretend that i'm somebody else anyway so the whole idea about uh leisure yeah i was i watched a video yesterday i also discussed uh this concept with my friend and he actually advised me to read uh, the uh, this article in praise of idleness by bertrand russell and i'm going to read it uh, well hopefully today but I'm not sure whether or not I'll have enough time. But on this week, I certainly will read it. Since it's not a big one, there's just 11 pages. It's almost nothing. But today I want to start from Wikipedia. So anyway, leisure has historically been the privilege of the upper class. So if uh, we consider leisure as a non-productive consumption of time, which is a definition by Thurstein Veblen, it's like many people didn't have access to leisure most of them like peasants and uh, probably middle class uh, workers proletariat whatever they had to work for the uh, most part of their days and the, the rest they ha have to spend like it's not even leisure it's just you know i guess 
a forced uh, recreation, it's not leisure. So when you're just tired and you fall asleep, it's not leisure. Or when you just eat and, you know, sit doing nothing, it's also not leisure. But anyway, so privilege of the upper class. Opportunities for leisure came with more money or organization and less working time, rising dramatically in the mid uh, to late 19th century, starting in Great Britain and spreading to other rich nations in Europe. So the, what's important here is to figure to realize that uh, it's 19th century, the mid to late 19th century. So before leisure was uh, the privilege of uh, kings, monarchs, you know, and upper class, and it were like uh, you know, few families in the kingdom. So, for example, in Russia, there probably were like. No, maybe you know this uh, aristocracy, but again, like how how many of them we had? Maybe like a thousand people, and the whole nation, or you know maybe ten thousand. But it's nothing. Like if we consider the population, like if we have uh, one million people and uh, only uh, like a thousand people have uh, privilege to have leisure, so it's one percent. It's basically this one percent is alive, and everybody else just uh, robots who do work to maintain this, uh, you know, luxurious uh, consumption of, uh, <laughs> of time of this class. Anyway, uh, the, the idea here is again, upper class uh, and only with uh, money and uh, organization. So there's organization, I guess, probably some social organizations like new ways of uh, some new politics, whatever, like uh, parliament opportunities came with more money or organization and less working working time rising dramatically in the mid to late 19th century and at the same time it's like it sounds a little bit you know in 19th century it was the age the beginning of 19th century it was the age of industrialization and uh, there were many people who were forced to work and the whole uh, idea of proletariat was uh, developed in the mid of uh, 19th century since most people had to work. And this upper class, once again, when I was uh, listening to this video by uh, where this uh, theory of uh, Veblen was, was described, it uh, reminded me uh, Karl Marx theory of uh, social, you know, different social classes and uh, struggle, class struggle. And this up, upper class or leisure class, it's, uh, it's very similar to to bourgeoisie and uh, everybody else just proletariat. But anyway, so even though there were lots of people who had to work a lot, there still were more people who were able to get free time and do whatever they wanted for themselves especially with the abolition of slavery, you know, the late 19th century and uh, developing certain, you know, whatever. It spreads, it spread, spread, it spread, spread by spread. Should be written, it spreads. That's strange. I want to see, I want to see spread, verb. I spread, will spread, process noun. That's strange. Why spread without S? I'm just curious. Spread. Uh, past tense and past participle spread. Oh, okay. It's like spread, spread, spread. I actually wasn't uh, <laughs> like, I study many like almost all, I studied the whole list of phrasal, not phrasal, irregular verbs, but I don't remember that spread was there. Anyway, it's spread. So it's like in, in past. It's spread as well as to the United States, although that country had a reputation in Europe for providing much less leisure despite its wealth. Okay, it was uh, first developed in Europe in mid of 19th century, in the late 19th century, and then it spread to the United States though that country had a reputation in Europe for providing much less leisure despite its wealth. So Americans were very pragmatic at that time and uh, their culture, culture 
was based on you know hard work and therefore leisure was less um, valuable for people anyway immigrants to the immigrants to the united states discovered they had to work harder than they did in europe immigrants to the united states oh, okay there's people who came from europe to united to the united states uh looking for you know some opportunities for some adventure whatever they just discovered that in in america they have to work even more that's cool Econo economists continue to investigate why americans work longer hours okay it's like even now it's still yeah, economists continue to investigate why americans work longer hours so it indicates that even today americans work more than other people even though they have um, more wealth than any other nations well, maybe just you know spirit of nation whatever in a recent book uh, lauren turcott argues that leisure was not created in the 19th century but is imbricated in the ox occidental occidental world occidental what's the word means occidental occidental uh someone from the western part of the world no oh, occidental 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 sounds almost like uh, accidental anyway occidental so it's like west uh but it's em embricated what's that word means i also don't know let's check it out imbricated uh, there's no even such a word damn it imbricated imbricated okay let's look at google dictionary imbricated uh, imbricated imbricate imbricate line lapped over stop it line lapped over each other in regular order it's like placed on top of each other lapped uh, maybe there's imbricate Imbricate. No, no such a word. Wikipedia uses strange words. But anyway, I got the meaning. So it was placed uh, on the accidental world, <laughs> world since the beginning of history. So basically, uh, to translate the sentence uh, in like normal English, I would say that it was um, 19th century. It was uh, in West uh, from the beginning of time, <laughs> from the beginning of history, right? It is imbricated in the accidental world. That's fucking like, that's why it's also hard to read Wikipedia since you may just learn all these words, which are completely useless uh, since you can't use them in a conversation. Nobody is going to understand them. Well, I mean, those people who study English, not I guess some native uh, speakers would be able to understand these words, but still it's like, it's useless since, uh, like, well, not useless, anyway, in, in writing, yeah, it's like in, they're, in writing they might be used, but there's what, what kind of ideas expressed here, the word imbricated, like why should, like placed, for example, right? So, or uh, leisure was not created in 19th century, but was, uh, imbricated in the accidental world like imbricated in the accidental world damn it like just but is imbricated basically but was there since the beginning of history right <laughs> was uh, in the west world since the beginning of history anyway so once once again what this paragraph tells us so it tells us that uh, leisure is a privilege of upper class. In mid mid of nineteenth century, it started become more valuable for lay people, and uh, it spread from Europe to America. In America, though, people worked harder and more, and there were more working hours so and uh, there's some guy Laurent Turcot who argues that uh, leisure 
wasn't created in the 19th century, but it was like always there in West in West world. Well, if we are considering Europe, of course, like the idea of Otsum, it was there from Socrates, even probably like earlier. But what I remember when I was reading Schopenhauer, I yeah, I found some quotes from Socrates in Latin and I memorized them. I was studying Latin at that time and memorizing some quotes. And uh, an original quote was Socrates Otsum. Socrates Otsum. Do I have this quote here? No, I don't have it, but I, I, I forgot it. So it was <laughs> eight years ago. Anyway, so there was a sentence which I made translate as I remember its meaning. So the meaning was that Socrates believed that the otsum or leisure was the, 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 the highest form of uh, commodity or property. And uh, yeah, anyway, let's go further. Like Canada, France, United Kingdom. Maybe they, th they mean something different by leisure, but it seems like it's the same word, the same concept. Just a new word, I mean, trans the word translated from, you know, from other languages, but the meaning is the same. In Canada, leisure in the country is related to the decline in work hours and is shaped by moral values in the ethnic, religious, and gender communities. In Canada, leisure in the country is related to the decline in work hours and is shaped by moral values and the ethnic, religious, and gender communities. So related to the decline in work hours. So leisure is related to the decline in work hours. What does it mean? Well, probably there were, yeah, in 19th century, people had to work like 16 hours, 12 hours, like 12 hours, hours a day, then 10 hours. And there was like strikes, uh, which uh, led to the point when working hours were reduced. And uh, yeah, I guess the concept was like, okay, we have to have more leisure. Yeah, give us more leisure. We don't want to work 12 hours, give us two hours for leisure. Anyway, uh, moral values. Yeah, shaped leisure, like the leisure shaped by moral values, ethnic, religious, and gender communities. In a cold country with winter's long nights and summer's extended daylight, favorite leisure activities include horse racing, team sports such as hockey, sin alons. Sinalons, don't know what the word means. Sinalons, some kind of game. Let's check it out. Sinalons. Sinalon, an informal occasion when people sing songs together. Whoa. Sinalon. Sinalon. Okay. Sinalons, roller skating and board games. All right. So the some leisure activities in Canada. All right. In cold country. Uh, <laughs> The churches tried to steer leisure activities by preaching against drinking and scheduling annual revivals and weekly club activities. Uh, by 1930, radio played a major role in uniting Canadians behind their local and religion, regional hockey teams. Play-by-play -play sports coverage, especially of ice hockey, absorbed fans far more intensely than newspaper accounts the next day. Rural areas were especially influenced by sports coverage. All right, let's talk about it. So now I see, I, I'm beginning to understand it a little bit in a broader way. So the concept of leisure, it's the whole idea that, you know, people have to work. They have to work a certain amount of time, like eight hours a day. Let's suppose that in the culture, like now, it seems that most of people believe that uh, to work eight hours a day is good. And then everybody has uh, eight hours of rest and or leisure, right? And uh, what is going to be done during these hours, it's actually not uh, structured. So by if we consider like from a socio sociological point of view, if we look at this concept, we can see that there are all sorts of activities. So work, it's like one thing, probably, you know, studying, it's another, like education. It's also uh, the activity which is uh, 
determined by society so you just uh kind of you know you start your life and you have certain things which you have to do like uh, first it's uh well, first you're free for a couple of years then you become you know you go to the kindergarten and there you have to do certain you know routines then you go to this to, to school there you also have to do certain routines and you're like you have five five hours of school and that's why i probably like it's so stupid i mean studying learning it's all like it's an amazing process but since it becomes a routine at the very young age when you are like seven years old and uh, everything else is considered as leisure so you go to school you spend there five hours a day six hours a day and then you have 10 12 hours uh, 11 hours for leisure and you usually don't study so you have your homework and for usually people like children hate homework so they prefer to do something else and what they are doing outside of uh, learning becomes like uh, their real like some passion whatever and uh, learning becomes kind of routine work and that's probably why everybody hates like studying and learning since uh, like there it's 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 crazy how our society is organized in that way that uh, like one of the best activities like learning like studying is considered as work or as something you know something something dull that people don't like to do anyway so the whole idea is that uh, there is a competition between certain groups so here we see uh, ethnic religious uh, gender communities moral values etc so the whole idea is that uh, there are certain groups which want you to do certain activities and uh, while you have leisure so in, there is competition for these eight hours or six hours or whatever amount of time people have outside of their work or learning and everybody wants to persuade you like to engage in their activity and leisure is basically yeah it's a fun idea i really like it i like that uh, you know this uh, this view that leisure is kind of you know something that you have and everybody wants to get it from you so everybody wants like to engage in a stupid activity like i'm doing the same thing now i'm just trying to uh, get your le in the internet that's so cool i mean now internet is uh, that's why it's growing so fast i mean the internet completely conquered the human mind like not completely but it's like if we are talking about uh, new generations people who are just have been born last decade or few decades yeah, it's like most of the time they spend uh, on the internet and all leisure is on the internet here and why it's here because there's so many amazing stuff so like you know me recording this video and you may watch it and you may like it and you may oh that's cool i may just watch this video every day and then you watch another video then you watch some you know tv shows whatever and leisure it's like before there were many activities once again like sports hockey whatever sinalons and people didn't know what to do but now it's like this media it organizes societies in certain you know in communities but not just in communities there are so many activities on the internet which you can do like video games i don't want to even mention them but the idea once again like uh, you're on the internet you spend most of the time on the internet and you spend all your leisure time on the internet doing nothing else but searching for something and basically uh doing something it's like you're manipulated by the internet like i'm man manipulated by the internet a lot but you know an average person who doesn't study himself or herself yeah i guess it's too easy to be completely uh, you know become a puppet like you know this word uh, jordan peterson's favorite word you're a puppet <laughs> that's true you're a puppet manipulated by huge corporations to read some stupid things to learn to watch some stupid movies to buy certain things to do certain things and leisure yeah here once again canada a few more words about canada there was cold time people were sitting at uh, you know in their houses uh, and uh, watching hockey <laughs> all right let's get uh, further 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 you know i'm trying to master the pronunciation of this word for for a year i still can say it perfectly like per there further let's go further let's go ahead <laughs> yeah sounds 
yes, health is easier to pronounce. Friends, leisure by the mid 19th century was no longer an individualistic activity. Leisure by the mid 19th century was no longer an individu individualistic individualistic activity. Activity. It was increasingly organized. In the French industrial city of Lille, with a population of 80,000 people in 1858, the cabarets or taverns for the working class numbered 1,300. Oh, that's a lot. So it's like 1,000 <laughs> in just one, one city, it's like 800,000 people. Wow. That's like unbelievable. I mean, I live in a town with uh, the population of half a million people. And uh, well, I don't know how many cabarets or taverns we have, but <laughs> certainly not 1,300. Maybe like 100, maybe a little bit more. But anyway, so or for or one for every three houses. Wow, one for every three houses. Lille counted counted 63 drinking and signing clubs 37 clubs for card players 23 for bowl, bowling bowling 13 for kittles and 18 for archery the churches likewise have their social organizations each club had a long roster of officers and a busy schedule for banque banquets, festivals, and uh, competitions. All right, so mid 19th century, leisure is no longer an individualistic activity. So you may take part in any group and do some stupid work. Yeah, it's like some form of entertainment. You go to theater, or you go to you know, cinema nowadays, or you go to wherever. And uh, yeah, people just you know compete for getting you in their in their activity. And there were too much like organized leisure in France in 1858. So I guess I put it in my you know like Canada, France. Some few sentences in. By the way, I have this list. So I, uh, yesterday, after, like, not yesterday, I was writing this list today at the morning, and um, everything, what I found yesterday valuable for the discussion, I just wrote down a few definitions and uh, some words uh, related to the concept, basically adjectives, and uh, today I'll add more, like, from, from this article, probably, I'll add that, you know, this, this town in France, the year the amount of people who live there and uh, one and like <laughs> the cabarets or taverns yeah taverns 1300 taverns yeah just an, just an example to emphasize how popular like organized leisure became anyway united kingdom so there is a huge article on united kingdom i get that i think I get through it fast. I'm not gonna like talk about every sentence. I'm just read it, and then I go and watch. Uh, get, then I go and find some mm, quotes for the discussion. But if there's something interesting, I probably will talk about it as well. Anyway, as literacy, wealth, ease of travel, and broadened sense of community grew in Britain from the mid 19th century onward. There was more time and interest in leisure activities of all sorts on the part of all classes. Opportunities for leisure activities increased because real wages conti continued to grow and, how and hours of work continued to decline. 19th century, in the middle of 19th century, well, that's strange. So the, <laughs> as far as I know, it was the opposite. Well, it wasn't the opposite, but you know, in the middle of 19th century, it's like 850 or something. It was uh, the growth of, uh, you know, this bourgeoisie class, and it uh, demanded working like for 12, 16 hours. And only at the end of 19th century, there was, well, I, I, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. In the United Kingdom, I, I studied more the history of Russia and uh, Germany and Russia at that time was still 
like uh, there was serfdom and uh, there was like uh, the abolish the abolition of slavery in russia came only at uh, 1861 so like 18, 18, 1850 there was like slaves and uh, it's like feudal society basically so in urban britain the nine hour day was increasingly the norm the nine hour day oh, okay nine hour like now half eight hour nine hour 1874 factory act limited the work week to 56.5 hours okay now it's like 40 hours yeah, it was uh, quite uh, you know what uh, earlier in comparison with other countries like germany i guess in germany it was different and in france probably it was different the movement toward an eight-hour day uh, furthermore system of routine and annual vacations came into play starting with white collar workers and uh, moving into the working class some 200 seaside resorts emerged thanks to cheap hotels and an expensive railway fares widespread banking holidays in the padding of many religious prohibitions against secular activities on sundays all right uh, in the late victorian era the leisure industry had emerged in all british cities and the pattern was copied across Western Europe and North America. It provided scheduled entertainment of suitable length and convenient localis, localis, whatever, at an inexpensive prices. This includes sporting events, music halls, and popular theater. By 1880, football was no longer the preserved for the social elite as it attracted large working class audiences oh it's like before 1880 football was only <laughs> yeah it was it was like i remember this definition of academia from a uh, devil's dictionary so uh, academia it's uh well, academ it's uh, the school where philosophy was taught like founded by plato uh, academia it's the school where football is taught <laughs> yeah it's like funny comparison anyway average gate was uh, 5000 uh, in 1905 rising to 23000 in 1913 the amount to 6 million paying customers with a weekly uh, turnover of 400000 pounds sports by 19 century 1900 generated some three percent of the total gross national product in britain professionaliz professionalization of sports was the norm although some new activities reached an unscale amateur audience such as lawn tennis and golf women were not allowed in some sports such as archery tennis badminton and gymnastics that's funny it's like all this sport industry which we have now it's like basically for some it's uh it's work like for those people who participate in competitions in, uh, in games but for those who watch it it's like a, it's a form of leisure so and all this no i i stopped um like when i was a child like in in, in late 90s i guess and probably the earliest uh, two 200s i was watching like not a lot of sport but you know i was watching olympic games i didn't watch football but i was watching lots of you know activities related to sport from time to time not like all the time but from time to time on tv i didn't have a computer and uh, yeah on tv sometimes it's like it, it's fun just to watch some stupid games but i stopped doing that like since i got a computer at home i I never used yeah by the way this is an interesting idea which uh, i want to share and i had it uh, today's morning when i was doing my exercise it's like i was thinking about uh, using the computer and the internet and basically this idea of leisure so i whenever i use the computer i use it mostly for educational purposes so i use it to learn something i don't use the computer for anything else and uh, i was thinking about like people in general uh those with whom i communicate from time to time and uh, it seems that for 
many people computer is a tool for entertainment so they get there for leisure for you know to relax to get rest whereas i get rest uh, when i am not at the computer so but computer for me is like a it's simultaneously it's leisure since uh, i like to do what i'm doing and it's also like kind of hard work so what i'm doing right now at the computer basically that's what i'm doing all the time so just le- uh, reading some articles watching videos related to like any uh, anything that i study and uh, since now i'm studying english mostly in philosophy and different concepts uh, so i just use the internet to understand better these concepts but i almost never use it for entertainment so for me like i may find entertainment in like you know in everywhere but the whole idea is that i'm not uh like i'm trying to stay away from all this industry of entertainment since uh, in my opinion it makes me stupid and all these comedy shows whatever it's like uh i think it's useless since um sometimes i watch some movies and uh i watch them exactly because i need to get rest when i have uh, when i'm not overwhelmed by studying i prefer to study like uh, if now i would consider my ideal day i wouldn't include any form of like watching movies and i try to fight with this desire of watching movies since 2000 i guess since 2011 when i first started writing my journals i remember at 2012 uh, i already was you know writing something well, today I watched this movie and probably I, I, I need to consider, you know, this uh, activity as something useless and I need to get rid of it. I need to watch as less movie as possible because it makes me feel stupid and dumb. And instead of that, I may just uh, watch something meaningful, watch some lectures or read some books or, you know, dedicate my time to something more productive. So, and then, it's like, as I said, I started focusing on this idea, like uh, using the internet only for certain purposes. But again, it's like, it's not... You know, this super productive uh, activity which uh, you know it's it's not focused it's not centered on productivity it's centered on doing something meaningful and getting meaningful information and when i again when i'm overwhelmed when i feel that i can't go further i need some rest i may watch some tv shows not now for example i'm watching diarrhea and uh, i'm so happy that i found this uh, tv show because it's basically it's it's my life. <laughs> I know many people may say that who watch Daryl. Oh, this is like many people tend to identify with this girl. But, uh, you know, in my case, yeah, I guess. Oh, well, it's not it's not me since I wasn't like this uh, smart and intelligent when I was in, uh, in, in, in school. So I was basically stupid and I couldn't, you know, be such, you know. But it's basically, uh, how would you say? Mm. It's like kind of ideal image of myself so when i watch uh, this uh, tv show i think that if now i could go back at school i'll certainly play this character like daria or her friend if i was a girl <laughs> if i was a man i'll probably will play uh, i don't know who somebody else anyway so once again a leisure where was i like victorian age activities sports yeah i was talking about sports and about like this uh, activity in general so as i said i prefer to use the internet only for studying purposes but study study for me is leisure that's important to understand it's actually what i'm doing now makes me feel excited and it makes me feel relaxed and it makes me like i find lots of fun in reading these articles and uh, studying philosophy watching some philosophical lectures studying psychology science it's like most of the time when i do that so you may see it right now so what i'm doing how i'm doing the emotions which i have it's like it's most of the time what's going on when i'm alone so i'm just sitting reading and when i'm alone i allow myself to like to think in a, a little different way so now i understand that it's like all recording and since even and even though i'm trying to play kind of this non-doing so i'm trying to think as if it's not recording i allow myself to think aloud without being concerned whether or not somebody is listening still there is uh, there is some you know i can't do it perfectly and uh, i can't say anything what i would say if i was alone and just reading this article on my own probably i'll you know make make fun of uh, 
most of uh, what's written here. Not most of, but you know. Okay, let's go on. Leisure was primarily a male activity with middle class women allowed in at the mar margins. Margins, what is margins? Let's check it out. Margins, 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 gross margin. The difference between what someone costs to produce and what is sold for. Margin, was just margin. Leisure was primarily a male activity with middle class women allowed at the margins. Okay, maybe. Margin, the empty space at the side of a page. The difference in the numbers of words, points, etc. The difference between what it costs a business to buy or produce something and what they sell it for. An additional amount of something such as time, money, or space that you include in order to make sure that you are successful in achieving something. Okay, I guess this is uh, like an additional amount of something such as time, money, or space. Uh, margins, the margins. Literally was primarily a male activity with middle class women allowed at the margins. Yeah, sometimes like allowed at the margins is basically a peculiar way to say, you know, sometimes. <laughs> uh, not sometimes, but you know, like kind of extra, it's like exception, yeah. It's like allowed at the margins, it's like basically a, like an exception. Allowed in as an exception. There was class differences with upper class clubs and working club class and middle class club pubs. Pubs. <laughs> Why they like use this sentence in this way? That's so funny. There were class differences with upper class clubs and working class and middle class pubs. Well, it's like pub, it's not a club. Yeah, I guess the meaning of the sentence is like difference between clubs and pubs that uh, clubs for upper classes and uh, pubs for working in middle classes. Anyway, heavy drinking declined. There were there was more betting on outcomes. Participation in sports and all sorts of leisure activities increased for average English people. And their interest in spectator sports increased dramatically. Yeah, it's like how you make people stupid. Just, <laughs> you know, this uh, ancient uh, Latin panem and what was it's like Breton, Breton uh, entertainment, but no, it's panem, it, <laughs> I forgot the word. Bread and shows. Yeah, but I forget the Latin, the Latin phrase. Anyway, uh, in by the 1920s, the cinema and radio attracted all classes, ages and genders in very large numbers. Giant palaces were built for the huge audiences that wanted to see Hollywood films. In Liverpool, 40% of the population attended one of the 19, one of the 69 cinemas once a week. 25% went twice. Traditionalists grumbled about the American cultural invasion, but the permanent impact was minor. Yeah, it's like all this movie industry, like now it seems, yeah, it's, why it's so damn popular? Why people watch movies and why it's so costly to make these movies? Like, you know, people invest how much? Like uh, millions, like hundreds of millions of dollars to make just one movie. And uh, all these professions like act actors and, uh, you know, filmmakers, they're modern, modern kind of role models. But, you know, a few hundred years ago, nobody paid attention to, like, uh, actors were basically the lower class. That's, like, in Shakespearean time, an actor was somebody who, you know, like, <laughs> uh, it's a lost, lo lost human being, a lost human being. So if you're an actor, it means that you are poor, that you, uh, it's not necessary, but mostly like when theater just emerged in the Shakespearean time, even before like maybe Chaucer time. So it wasn't so popular to be an actor. And Shakespeare by himself, I guess he wasn't like, you know, a rich, famous, maybe he was famous, but he wasn't rich and, you know, well received by society but now like if you're a filmmaker and if you make uh, movies which cost 
to produce like 100, 100 millions of dollars. It's like, it's immediately like, wow, that's so cool. That's so amazing. But uh, yeah, it's only cool and amazing because lots of people watch it. And why people watch it, it's like so, so, so excited. Like, why do you watch some movies? Like, it's an interesting question. Like, most, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't watch movies. I mean, I've watched, like in my lifetime, I watched, <laughs> I guess, more movies than anybody whom I know since uh, I had lots of leisure time. And uh, yeah, I, I watched a lot of movies and TV shows. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that I like it. I say that most of the time when I watch movie or, or a TV show, I do it just to get rest. And uh, I do it, like most of what I watch, I don't like. If I would, uh, if I would say, if I would count the amount of movies which I watched and which I would recommend to somebody watch, I wouldn't like, maybe it's 100 movies, uh, which I think deserve to be watched. And all other like thousands of movies, which I watched, I think they're just useless crap. But the whole idea of making movies, like writing books, basically. Yeah, it's like sharing our experience. And uh, yeah, it became so popular nowadays. I mean, it's like all our social life is shaped. Most of our social life is shaped by movies and by by media anyway let's go further too much too much too much uh, the british showed a more profound interest in sports and in greater variety than any rival rival what is rival is it the nation or something rival a person group or organization that you compete with in sport business a fight etc competitor okay competitor more profound interest in sports <laughs> well i would like to check uh, what uh, other you know uh, i guess if i just look at uh, you know some other articles wikipedia articles about this concept like if it's written in German language, there certainly wouldn't be such a sentence. <laughs> British show a more profound interest in sports. Yeah, and how did you know that? Just by, you know, comparing all breeders, like comparing the amount of people who, who participate in sports. But uh, yeah, I guess it's very suspicious. But anyway, they gave pride of place to such moral issues as sportsmanship and fair play pride of place to such moral issues as sportsmanship and fair play okay the competition was fair they didn't try to cheat cricket became symbolic of the imperial spirit throughout the empire soccer provide soccer proved highly attractive to the urban working classes which introduced the radley spectator to the sports world in some sports, there was significant controversy in the fight for mature purity, especially in rugby and rowing. New games became popular almost overnight, including golf, lawn tennis, cycling, and hockey. Women were much more likely to enter these sports than the old established ones. Oh, new sports for women. That's cool. The aristocracy and landed gentry with their ironclad control over land rights, dominated hunting, shooting, fishing, and horse racing. Cricket became, had, became, had become well-established among the English upper class in the, 19th, in the 18th century, and was a major factor in sports competition among the public schools. Army units around the empire had time on their hands and encouraged the locals to learn cricket so they could have some entertaining competition. Most of the empire embraced cricket, with the exception of Canada. Cricket test matches international began cricket test matches began by the 1870s. The most famous is that between Australia and Britain for the Ashes. Whew, I've got through history of leisure. I'm just curious to check it in Russian language just to see 
Uh, they, they call it free time. Uh, in Russia, we don't have, actually, we have a concept. It's uh, called, uh, yeah, it's here, dasuk. But somehow they don't use this word. That's strange for me. Like, I mean, if I, uh, if I had written this article, I'll put the, the word dasuk instead of svobodne uh, vreme, which is free time. Okay, economical, socio social, sociological. There is Russian uh, researcher. Then there is uh, Aristotle. Yeah, Russian researcher who talks about Aristotle, like gives Aristotelian definition of leisure, which I'll check later since I'm interested in Aristotle and I'll probably find it. And I'll show you how I do that, like, you know, how I search uh, some information using books which I which I already read uh, in Russian. I mean, it's later, not now. Slovo leisure, once again, was uh, from Latin, with Sarah. Be, be free. See, there's a difference in Russian. They say, like, uh, Latin litzera means be free, whereas... Uh, in English, they say it means not uh, to be allowed. It's not be free. So there's a difference. So one thing is like be free. And another thing is to be allowed or be allowed by somebody else. So be free does, doesn't involve anybody. But uh, to be allowed means that, uh, you know, so it's different meaning. But anyway, so there is you no know, history, some types. Uh, a social hedonistic type. Yeah, I guess it's uh, from, it was borrowed from some, you know, this whole idea of uh, leisure class. It's a, so a social hedonistic type. It's also kind of, it's borrowed from their capital society. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's like hard working people. Yeah, but kind of uh, apotheos, apotheosis of hard-working people if you well, almost nothing so it's like if, if i want to study leisure the concept of leisure there's almost nothing on wikipedia com in comparison with english let's just check other languages like espanol for example yeah there's a little bit more there's history and yeah history culture dimensions topos or oh, also also like also yeah it's from <laughs> yeah i like the word uh, i don't know how it pronounced uh, correctly but it looks like o o c i o and uh, o uh, in english it was o t u m otium otium or it's like very familiar Anyway, so that it's done for today. I'm not going to read Wiki more today. It's like I got through the history and the French United Kingdom. Yeah, tomorrow I'll probably get through types. But for now, let me, let me show you how I look for quotes. And this may be an exciting experience since uh, you know, I don't like quotes. I mean, for me, like I usually look for quotes here. On, uh, goodreads.com so it just you get there you put uh, the word you put the word and you see immediately there are like lots of lots of quotes from different i don't read all of them usually i read few like here on the first page i read uh, like those which are short and uh, if i know the person i read the quote if i don't know the person i usually skip it i don't I don't like to read quotes by people whom I don't know. And by knowing, I mean, like, at least I, uh, for example, J.K. Rowling, I know she wrote Harry Potter and I'm not going to read the quote. Well, I'm going to read the quote since it's on, on the top. But if it was somewhere here, I wouldn't read here because, you know, it's not a person whom I'd like to, you know, borrow a quote from. But Heraclitus, I certainly would. <laughs> would read a quote and try to figure out what it means. And even if it's like something stupid, I'll still probably put it in my quote list since I just like Heraclitus. Anyway, the mind is not a book to be opened at will and examined at leisure. Thoughts are not 
etched on the inside of skulls to be pursued by an invader. The mind is a complex and many layered thing. Well, I don't know where this is from Harry Potter, but you know, the girl talks about the mind <laughs> and uh, the mind is not a book. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna comment on this since <laughs> I don't wanna offend anybody here. Uh, Heraclitus, time is a game played beautifully by children. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. Time is a game played beautifully by children. Time is a game. What does it mean? Time is a game. Played beautifully by children. It's like leisure. Let's suppose that he uses the word time to substitute it with or replace it with the word leisure. So leisure is a game played beautifully by children. Hmm. All right. So the whole, I guess the idea is that, you know, it's hard to interpret. You may interpret it anyway, in any way, but you, know, you may look at children to see how like the ideal model of uh, spending your time, like, do, do what children do. <laughs> yeah, be, be stupid and don't care about anything. Yeah, maybe smart. Like, you know, if you divide your time, if you divide your time, between work and leisure, well, probably leisure, like doing something silly makes a lot of sense if you work hard. No, but if your life, like in my, as, I, as I mentioned before, I don't divide my time on work and leisure. So for me, like all the last uh, 10 years were kind of time of leisure, even though I'm like working as, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know who works even half of the time which I work since I'm working like all the time. But for me, it's like work and leisure simultaneously. But anyway, so Bukowski, I don't like to read Bukowski since, uh, you know, I have some, like he, he, he influences me in a bad way. So like whenever I read Bukowski, like some poems, I, sometimes I like him, but most of the time I prefer to not uh, give him attention since, uh, you know, Bukowski, it's not my type of poet, type of a poet, like too, too stupid, <laughs> let's say that. <laughs> yeah, too stupid, not in terms of, you know, like, well, now I see that it's hard to think aloud. So before it was so easy when I was reading this Wikipedia page, but now I came to uh, this place and there are some people, some quotes, and uh, I have to comment on these people. I know, for example, Bukowski, of course, I may talk a lot about Bukowski, even though I didn't pay a lot of, like I read maybe like 50, I don't think 50, I read 10 poems of Bukowski and maybe like 100, 100 not even 100, like 10 poems and 20 quotes for my entire life. And I have not, I wasn't inspired by this guy but few poems, one, one, one poem I even tried to memorize, I remember I, I read it maybe a few, three years ago. And uh, yeah, he is kind of guy who, you know, who, like I certainly would like him when I was a child, you know, to smoke, to drink, to have sex, to do all stupid things. And uh, yeah, if, if I, had found them when I was a child, I'll probably say, oh, this is like, you know, this uh, defiant, defiant soul. <laughs> be against everybody, be against society, be against, like, be, do, do it on your own. Uh, you know, whatever, what, what the hell? I'm trying to talk about something that I don't understand. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm making fool of myself, let's go further. Uh, Emerson, Emerson, Emerson. I, didn't, I tried to read a book by Emerson. One book after reading Nietzsche in Nietzsche's uh, The Twilights of Idols. At the end of the book, he mentions Emerson and praises him a little bit. 
And I remember after reading that book, I was curious about this guy, Emerson. I found this book on the internet. I tried to read, but I couldn't manage to read. But I know Emerson influenced Thoreau. And, uh, you know, I have some, some, no, I like Thoreau. And uh, I probably would like Emerson too. Like, let's, well, I, I may read this quote. Why not? Guard well your spare moments. Yeah, guard well your spare moments. Like spare basically means leisure and guard, like defend, protect. They are like uncut diamonds. Discard them and their value will never be known. Improve them and they will become the brightest gems in a useful life. It's like, you know, this not moral, but kind of motivational quote. Yeah, guard your spare moments. Yeah, sounds good. Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it's just a beautiful phrase, which basically means like, uh, pay attention to what you're doing when you have leisure. Yeah, that's all. And it's going to be good. I, it's like, it's beautiful expression of, you know, some, it's not what I'm looking for. Uh, don't know who is that, don't know who is that, don't know who is that, Cicero, let's read Cicero. Uh, read at every weight, read at all hours, read within leisure, read in times of labor, read as one goes in, read as one goes out. The task of the educated mind is simply put, read to lead. All right, so this is like, it confirms my personal worldview so okay, most of my adult life i spent by reading and reading like you know there were times when i was able to read like 10 hours a day for months to read uh, like a word to, to read a war and peace in five days you may you 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 may imagine like <laughs> how how you know so this is Cicero right so who is the Cicero he, he was a Roman Roman sen no, he wasn't senator well it's like governor not he wasn't even a governor he was like a public speaker in Rome one of the best well-known public speaker probably he was a senator I don't exactly remember but he was killed uh, during this uh, you know under Caesar and uh, I guess there was Catalina uh, conspiracy. I was reading, I remember, who was that? Who was that? Salusti, Salusti, and he writes about Catalina conspiracy. But uh, what I know about Cicero, I know from, from some articles in Wikipedia. I read one of his books, uh, which was uh, like, I didn't re read the whole book. I read it partially, I took, took it from library, it was 2012. The beginning of 2012 at the same time when i was reading plato and uh, i also read uh, plutarch's uh, comparative lives and cicero there was cicero was compared to dimosphen or demosphen it's like i had no russian pronunciation dimosphen let's say so and there was comparative uh, lives and cicero yeah I, I i remember when i was reading comparative lives i always tried to compare like who was the better man and for me, Dimosphen was certainly way better than Cicero. Cicero was like, you know, this speaker who, who was just a good speaker. And, uh, well, he was an educated man. He studied Greek language and he, he knew both languages, Greek and Latin, and he was uh, kind of famous, but he was, you know, a politician. Yeah, that's the, that's the difference. So Cicero, he wasn't a philosopher. He was mostly a politician. And he, uh, like, you know, at one time he may say one thing, at another time he may say another thing and interpret it in a different way. So the whole idea, like, sister, I basically, I, I didn't, I, I also remember I was reading in 2013, this guy, what was his name? Mm, Petrarca, Petrarca is like uh, Italian uh, enlightenment, not enlightenment, but Renaissance, Italian Renaissance probably the founder, one of the founders of Italian Renaissance, Petrarca, he was writing some books dedicated to Beatrice, I guess, Petrarca, Beatrice. Yeah, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I didn't read 
his poems. I guess Petrarca is uh, is a, not a bad poem since he is like still uh, like he survived survived for for a millennium. But uh, I was reading his uh, books uh, where he argued with a physician, and basically it was in in, in the attacks on the physician like if we translate to english it's going to be attacks on the physician and this uh, petrarca he tried tries to you know argue he always uh, he always brought cicero to defend his statements and basically he was cursing a physician like a doctor for you know arguing about something he was saying like poetry literature uh, philosophy like these are the most important arts and the, your stupid medicine is just uh, nonsense it's like well it's 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 good for society but you know all aristocracy and uh, open-minded people it's like uh, it's all they all are superior to physicians and to medicine and all this stuff and i hated like at that moment i was interested mostly in no, I was watching lots of lectures on physics and uh, probably, I don't remember exactly, but the whole idea, he was cited Cicero and I, I later wrote in my journal that, uh, you know, I, he, <laughs> I, he, I, at first I was writing, like when I started reading Petrarca, I was curious about him and I was thinking, oh, this is one of the most, uh, you know, famous guy. I was reading an article on Wikipedia and they say that he was like so cool, so great person. And when I started reading, I was, you know, excited and I was putting in my diary, like, I'm going to read Pet Petrarch, I'm going to, you know, it's, it's very interesting what, what I'll find there. And then after three days, I uh, gave up reading Petrarch with uh, great contempt. And I was, and I wrote a few pages in my diary, basically uh, dismissing Petrarch. And with Petrarch, I also dismissed Cicero since he always uh, cited Cicero. And I even mentioned like at my diaries. <coughs> something related to that that's why I'm, that's why i'm talking too much about it but anyway i like sister i mean he's like certainly a good <laughs> he's a guy whom i may trust and uh my view of uh sister of 2013 which is like was the time when i was reading him because now it's very different and now i have more admiration even for petrarch and for sister at that time i was kind of you know this rebellious character so i didn't like anybody i was reading i was reading books and uh, there was a few guys whom i liked uh you know, schopenhauer nietzsche kant uh for like all germans basically feuerbach picked yeah he well, hegel after schopenhauer my my uh attitude towards hegel changed but anyway i still liked him and i liked also no Asian guys like Plato, Aristotle, sex, no, sex, I didn't read sex superiors back then. Giotta, Giotta, some of our writers. But anyway, let's get and say something about the quote. So read, uh, basically he says, like, read all the time. And this is like, you know, my life since 2008. Yeah, since, uh, I don't say in 2008. Yeah, since the summer of 2008, like I follow this advice, but uh, not like there was moments when I was, you know, a little bit <laughs> conspicuous, dubious about that. And I was thinking that reading is also makes uh, like, you shouldn't be uh, like so overwhelmed with reading. So it's, there's something else, but uh, to replace all sorts of meaningless activities with the reading, it's a great idea. So if you, if you, for example, you know, if you want to go for a walk to do some exercises or to do some meaningful job, it makes sense. So you probably, I, I would probably choose now if I have power to go for a walk instead of reading. But, uh, you know, if you have a choice to watch TV, to watch some comedy, comedy show or to watch some movie, and at the same time you have power to read, it's probably better to read and the same like you may take a book everywhere and read it everywhere when you're doing something but of course i don't recommend you know like when you have your phone and you read all the time from your phone uh wherever you are like you may be on a date and you just read no don't do that don't follow scissor here but anyway like reading 
that's a good quote. I'll take it and I'll probably build like five, 10 minutes of uh, discussion, maybe dedicated to this quote. I may just talk about it a little bit more uh, since I like it. And I should certainly want to find some opposite uh, quote since uh, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, there were some great passages attacking reading and uh, it's going to be interesting to see in them in the contrast. And I can easily find actually, here's my reading list. Here's my reading list. Uh, it was in Zarathustra, I guess. Yeah, Zarath Zarathustra. And uh, now I'm gonna I'm gonna find this passage. So read. Oh man, there's so many. Okay, reading. Reading. Nineteen. So, wait, just an introduction. This is it. I'm reading and writing. So I'm going to read it quickly. I'm going to read it quickly. Uh, just in the contrast to Cicero's uh, quote. So once again, Cicero, let's, let's go that way. So read at every weight, read at all hours, read within leisure, read in times of labor, Read as one goes in, read as one goes out. The task of the educated mind is simply put, read to lead. So now we read Nietzsche. Of all that is written, I love only that which one writes in his blood. Write with blood and you will experience that blood is spirit. It is not easily possible to understand the blood of another. I hear the reading idlers, idlers, idlers. I, I guess he argues with Cicero here. <laughs> Whoever knows the reader will do nothing more for the reader. One more center of readers and the spirit itself will stink. That everyone is allowed to learn to read ruins not only writing in the long run, but thinking too. Once the spirit was God, then it became human. And now it is even becoming a rubble. Whoever writes in blood and proverbs does not want to be read, but to be learned by heart. In the mountains, the shortest way is from peak to peak, but for that one must have long legs. Proverbs should be peaks, and those who are addressed should be great and tall. The air thin and pure, danger near, and the spirit full of cheerful spite. These fit together well. I want to have goblins around me, for I am courageous. Courage that scares off ghosts creates its own goblins. Courage wants to laugh. I no longer sympathize with you. This could beneath me. This cloud beneath me. This black and heavy thing at which I laugh. Precisely, this is your thundercloud. You look upward when you... Okay, it's like there's no more about reading. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, this is not a quote right so readers uh, i hate reading idols idlers whoever knows the reader will do nothing more for the reader one more century of readers and the spirit itself will stink that everyone is allowed to learn to read ruins not only writing in the long run but thinking too yeah well reading nietzsche is uh it's not leisure, it's hard labor. And uh, in Nietzsche, most uh, of uh, passages, they're like, you like to read them, you basically have to understand Schopenhauer, Kant, uh, Hegel, and uh, some other philosophers who, you know, the whole idea is that most of what he say is ironic and uh, what he says about reading maybe like he may just you know in some in some moments he may just take an idea something which he uh, truly believes in and start attacking it from the opposite side so that it seems that almost he's like he can he contradicts himself but it's not a contradiction he just you know he exercises his power attacking his own beliefs and ideas and sometimes he does it so well that he uh comes to the conclusion that it was like his beliefs were stupid and eventually like all Nietzsche is all about like the highest form of skepticism when you don't take for granted anything like no dogma 
everything is uh, suspicious. Anyway, let's go further. Yeah, I like this reading, the whole the whole idea of reading quotes and finding something. Abraham Lincoln. Well, let's let's give a credit to this guy and read his quote, <laughs> since it uh, you know at the top, almost at the top. Why not? Even though it's like for me, Abraham Lincoln, it's basically nobody. Since I don't know who who I know he was an American president, but it's for me it's almost nothing. I watched a movie about Abraham Lincoln but uh, i haven't read any of his book and i didn't study him and for me it's basically like nobody anyway my father taught me to work but not to love it i never did like to work and i don't deny it i'd rather read tell stories crack jokes talk laugh anything but work so it's like <laughs> that's cool i like it it's it's funny even though it may be also ironic but anyway so uh, this is like uh, don't work right but it's about leisure so the quote about leisure basically he says like you know you may work but you shouldn't love to work it's stupid like it's better to do something that you it's like i, I prefer confucian uh you know definition of not work but you know confucian quote when he say where he says that uh, just find what you like to do and you don't need to work uh, at all just do what you like uh, but do it well so that it may be created by society and you may forget about work yeah okay and just like girl you know who's that who's that who's that who's that know nothing about them this guy yeah but it's too long i mean now i don't have time to Orwell it's from 1984 I read this book but I'm not gonna take like I can't I can't use it so probably there's something meaningful written I, I'm not I have of course I have time to read this one paragraph but I understand that it's impossible to use for a conversation for a discussion so I can take it bring it to discussion and read the whole the whole this quote and then discuss it since uh, in my conversations uh, it's like if you read something longer than a few sentences it gets it creates certain troubles and awkwardness and it's not what I'm going to do. So that's why I'm going to skip this. Even though if it was as short as this, I would probably read it since I, well, I admire Orwell to some degree. Huxley, well, it's Huxley. It's almost like Orwell and it's short. And this is what I'm going to read right now. Every man with a little leisure and enough money for railway tickets. Every man indeed who knows how to read has its has it in his power to magnify himself, to multiply the ways in which he exists, to make his life full, significant, and interesting. <clears throat> so again, uh, railway tickets and uh, knowing how to read. That's cool. So now you don't need railway tickets, you just need the internet. And basically you may travel everywhere, like literally you may travel fucking everywhere sitting at, at home and using the computer, you know, that's so amazing. By traveling everywhere, of course, I don't mean, you know, find the picture or some map and just look what's going on there. This is traveling everywhere. So when I go and read this book, it's for me, it's like I'm traveled to the midst of uh, 20th century in the mind of one of the most famous uh, philosopher. And I just get through his mind and I spend half an hour. And for me, it's like one of the, best journeys which i may have i mean i'm not talking about this gap in particular but about traveling itself so i may go here thus spoke that Zarathustra, uh, read like one paragraph and travel into like 19th centuries one of the best 19th centuries mind and see what was going on there and this is like wow the internet <laughs> that's amazing anyway pascal by the way pascal i want to show you something The last time when I uh, got in library, it was a week ago, I took a book by Pascal. Okay, it's here. Book from library. Pascal, Pences. Pences basically meditations or thoughts or quotes. And there is like the whole book of Pascal's quotes. And uh, I already read it in Russian. Uh, I remember 2015. And the first 
pro and I was studying skepticism by that time. I was studying Sextus Empiricus, and I was surprised when I discovered Pascal. Like the first few pages, I was uh, there was lots of skepticism in there, and Pascal was familiar with uh, skeptical school with Pyrrhonism, skepticism, and I was wow, that's so cool. I never before encountered like I, I didn't know anything about Pascal. He was such a great thinker, but then. Uh, after reading 10, 15 pages, I found that he uh, shifted towards some, you know, dogmatic, uh, like he, he, at first he made fun of skepticism and it was funny, but then he started, you know, he became, a, became more dogmatized and eventually I dropped uh, reading him since, uh, well, I thought that, no, it wasn't the way where I want to go. Like for me, I am like the manifestation of skepticism to some, like most most of uh, most of the time. Anyway, uh, I made this letter very long because I did not have the leisure to make it shorter. Yeah, that's cool. This is this is wow. That's that sounds very. <laughs> that's what I'm doing right now. So this is I made this video uh, very long since I don't have leisure to make it shorter. Of course, like I may take this whole video, uh, find some you know interesting thoughts which I had during this uh, stream during this recording and just make five minute video, like cutting all these moments and saying something meaningful. If there were some moments which I said like meaningful, but I don't have leisure, I don't have so much time, but I'd like to do this in the process. So I believe that if I continue doing that for a certain amount of time, like every day, if I dedicate an hour studying uh, concepts uh, in this format, just by streaming online, getting through all this stuff and uh, making comments and just basically verbalize the process of my thinking, then I'll achieve the uh, high quality. So I get to the point where I'll be able to speak, to tell what I'm doing, what I'm thinking about, and it's going to be relevant to those people who are fascinated about philosophy, about studying, about science, whatever. And that's, that's great. I know that's now it's the quality of my performance is low and i know that if i reach the uh, like what's here what, what's my aim here so to reach certain a level of authenticity and uh, now i probably somewhere at like two three and a ten like on a scale from zero to ten i'm like on three or or maybe four so i need like six more points well also language the my ability to describe things to uh, be uh, precise and uh, use certain language. Now I see that like with language, it's always complicated since uh, English isn't my native language. But what I'm doing is like the purpose, I'm studying language. That's the way how I study. So it's uh, not memorizing some words, it's just speaking, thinking, learning to think aloud, learning to speak aloud, learning you know, to speak up, learning by doing learning by using language instead of just memorizing stuff. Oh, I like memorizing stuff too, but now it's not the purpose. Anyway, so I made this letter very long because I don't have the leisure to make it shorter. Sounds great, I'll, I'll put it to my list uh, since uh, there's something to talk about. Thorough, but too long. Yeah, too long, can't get it. So some other guy, don't know who's that. Let's go down. Uh, Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong, let's read that guy. Revolution is not a dinner party. Oh, I already know this quote. Or writing an essay or painting a picture or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely and gentle, so tempered, kind, courteous, restrained and magnanimous. Revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one classes overthrows the other. Yeah, but how it relates to leisure <laughs> man like sometimes searchers are strange who's that guy never seen that guy before but you know i give him a try just to read 10 10 lines dearest creature in creation study english pronunciation oh come on i've read this poem already <laughs> how it came that <laughs> leisure yeah it's like it was published by vitalina one of uh, the members of my club uh, maybe a month ago and i've read this poem i remember that's funny seneca seneca is uh, yeah for me he was a kind of role model in 2008 i remember 
well, yeah, basically what I'm doing here, I'm just telling the story from my experience <laughs> of studying philosophy. It's not just, you know, going through quotes. It's, there's, there's something more. Anyway, uh, Seneca, yeah, let, let me tell you how I first discovered Seneca. I was working as a meal cooker <laughs> in a cafe. So I basically uh, prepared meat for a couple of weeks. So I was looking for a job. Uh, I I was looking for a job and I left my phone in a newspaper and I was called by some guy and uh, invited to have this job. I said, I, have, I had no experience, but he said, that's okay, we'll teach you. So I came there. Uh, the first week I was studying how to prepare meat on, you know, on fire. And uh, the second week I was working and then I I went to the sea and like I just gave up, gave up the work because uh, I saw no value in continuing. But at this time, I also discovered a book of uh, aphorisms or quotes from different philosophers. And it was a book, uh, I guess there were certain topics. I don't remember. Yeah, probably there were certain topics and each topic was... Uh, covered by different philosophers. So for example, if we take love, and there was like quotes from different philosophers about love. Then there was like topic life, different quotes about life. And it was 2007, 2007, the August of 2007. I even can say the weeks. So it was a 28, a 20, 20, 20th August, I moved to the South and I was working since, uh, I guess since 6 August of 2007. Yeah, till 20th, 20th August, August of 2007. And I was reading this book uh, and Seneca, I didn't know who was that guy. I, I had no internet and I couldn't find, like I couldn't discover anything about him. But I was uh, I, like, whenever I read his quote, I was, wow, this guy was really smart. Like it was kind of, you no, know, for me it was, wow, this, like at first I was reading some some quotes about, you know, the subjects, but then I decided just to look all quotes uh, written by Seneca. And I was thinking, he, yeah, I was thinking that it wasn't a man, I was thinking it was a woman, since in Russia, you know, Russian, like it's the same name, but it's, uh, I guess I spelled it Seneca. Seneca, yeah, it's like the same, sp the same, per the same way in Russia, so we say Seneca, not Seneca, Seneca. And I was thinking that Seneca in Russia, when we have a at the end of the word, it's like ending, Russian ending, it basically indicates that uh, female gender. And I was thinking, oh, it's probably a woman. And uh, like he was saying some smart things. And I was thinking, wow, how, where this woman came from? Like why she was so smart? And there was no information about Seneca. And later I, uh, I don't remember actually when I, I probably found like, a year after that, I only discovered that Seneca was a man, and uh, I discovered by, you know, I had a huge en encyclo encyclopedia, encyclo encyclopedia, like written encyclopedia, 10 volumes, and I found Seneca there, and oh, it was a man, like Asian Stoic, that's cool, What's, what, what this school was about, yeah, it's like my interest in philosophy shaped at that time, but yeah, I remember Seneca was like, you know, I felt strong admiration for that guy uh, almost for all these years, but it's like not strong, like not for all these years, of course, it's like I guess I'm exaggerating, exaggerating, but uh, yeah, I would listen to what this guy say. I mean, leisure without books is death and burial, burial, burial of man alive. Yeah, I knew this quote in Latin. I, I memorized it in Latin when I was studying Latin and uh burial 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 leisure without books is death and burial of a man alive so it's basically the same what uh Cicero says and Seneca was a contemporary of Cicero they lived in the same like in, in Rome he wasn't uh, he wasn't a contemporary he lived later he was like Cicero dead Seneca was born I guess at uh, the middle of uh, the first century before Christ and uh Cicero died at that time and Seneca died at like zero something like from zero to ten of uh, modern era and uh, yeah I remember like I certainly I knew this quote before 
and uh, yeah, all this like my activity, you know, my studying philosophy, this uh, obsession with reading. I guess this quote, uh, I I even could read it at that that period of time, 2007, which I just described, and uh, it probably shaped my you know passion for reading, for learning as well. And Seneca, since he was like you know like Elon Musk for modern businessmen. So for me, it's like the same authority for that time. Now, of course, I <laughs> I, 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 I changed, but not completely. I mean, Seneca is still a good guy, though uh, sto like the whole Stoic school. I'm, after reading Sext Empiric, I'm not. So, you know, so, oh, I'm still love Stoics anyway. Uh, but not completely. There are some things which I highly disagree, and I, <laughs> you know, it's anyway. Let's stop here. Seneca. Yeah, I put this quote as well, and we'll argue a lot about books, I guess, this week and about leisure. So, do we have somebody else whom I know? Bukowski again. Bukowski, Bukowski, Sartre. Well, I've, I would read this quote, but it's too long. Sartre. Yeah, I read a couple of books by Sartre, 2014. The Age of uh, Adolescence, I guess. Few books. The name of the book in Russian, I just translated in Russian, but I don't remember exactly who is that. Show, yeah, George, George Bernard Show. Okay, let's read Show. I like these guys as well. It's like it's it's a long quote, but still it may be used. The secret of being miserable is to have leisure to bother about whether you are happy or not. The cure for it is occupation, because occupation means preoccupation. And preoccupied person is neither happy nor unhappy, but simply alive and active. That's why it's necessary to happiness that one should be tired. Well, I like, yeah, I could, it's like, you know, <laughs> if we take uh, the life of Bernard Shaw, who like never did any <laughs> serious work, but was engaged in intellectual activity and was writing books and like studying, writing books. Yeah, but it's, it's I mean, who says that uh, work must be something related to physical labor? Yeah, it's like intellectual work, cool. And to be preoccupied with writing and reading and thinking, that's pretty cool. I want leisure to read an immense amount. Fitzgerald. Yeah. The short stories of Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah, I've read uh, The Great Gatsby, 2018. And watched the movie. And that was everything I like. I, I didn't love. No, oh, well, I could say I didn't like it. But it was kind of. Yeah, I liked it to some degree, but. Not complete. Anyway, so now I'm going to stop uh, <laughs> recording this stream. So I found some quotes and uh, I guess I'll look for more quotes. And uh, yeah, on different sites, since three quotes, it's just too little. I'll, I'll, find, I'll look for three or five more quotes, but not now, maybe later. So now I have some other things to do. And later i probably will read this article or i'll read it uh, tomorrow it's like i want to read it i mean record the stream of reading this article there are 10 pages and uh yeah to read them it takes probably 30 minutes for me but uh, if i'll make comments on each paragraph or each sentence i guess it'll take a few hours maybe three hours but anyway yeah I, i'll try I'll try it tomorrow, not today. I'll read this article tomorrow and, uh, yeah, and find some new thoughts from this article, which I may take for the discussion at the speaking club. So that's uh, basically uh, all I wanted to study today. That's enough. So now I'm going to finish this video. If you like it, if you want me to continue and uh, make it better, subscribe to my channel click likes do all these stupid things uh, <laughs> and uh, you know if you're a native english speaker and you may probably see that sometimes i use words which are completely insufficient to describe a certain action or certain thought uh, you may just help me by uh, by giving uh, you know 
not an advice, <laughs> by just writing in a comment the better way of saying some phrase. So whenever I say something which is uh, which sounds strange uh, to Russian, since some thoughts uh, like I was studying language by thinking, and there are lots of uh, language which I use, which is just uh, direct uh, borrowing from Russian thoughts. So just uh, most some of my expressions and words, they're just literal translations from Russian language. And sometimes they don't fit to English. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm learning how to think in English and to speak in English all the time. But still, it's like since I was thinking in Russian and reading and writing in Russian for 30 years, and I'm studying English only for five years. It's uh, hard for me to be like fluent in this way. So sometimes I use words which aren't appropriate. And uh, if you notice these words, so if you see that I said something that can be said better, like a native speaker, you might write me a comment. And you know, usually when uh, somebody corrects me, I really like it. So if you have some, if you really want to criticize me, I I appreciate that. And uh, especially if you want to crit help me with grammar with the way how I speak. So just write, write it down and uh, I promise I'll check it. I'll try to implement it in my vocabulary. And you know, whenever somebody corrects you, like I've noticed, well, if, if it's done all the time, I guess it's uh, not so productive, but it's uh, when it refers to video, like if there's just one, two, three, five corrections, I'll probably remember it and uh, later we'll use it instead of using uh, words which I use, which uh, don't match to know the natural way of saying something anyway that was fun see you next time bye bye